Hi, this is Mike Tachik. I'm the president of Dairyland Electrical Industries, and today's session will be on safety considerations for AC mitigation designs. There's a number of protection issues that come up in this topic. Basically, the concern is in minimizing voltage between two points. It could be two points that a worker could get across. It could be the voltage difference across an insulated joint from one side to the other between a pipeline and ground. It could even be between grounding systems or across a single grounding system where a voltage gradient could exist in the earth. Uh, there could also be differences between the pipe voltage and other structures nearby. It could be the casing that it goes through at a road crossing. It could be a transmission tower, a substation, any other foreign structure. If voltage can exist between two points, then that could reach perhaps unsafe levels and needs to be addressed. There are a couple different sources of overvoltage. There's temporary conditions that exist only during an event such as lightning, a lightning event, or an AC power system fault from an AC distribution or transmission system uh, that is there only for the duration of the fault until a clearing device operates, such as a power breaker. Or it could be that there's just steady state concerns, and those are induced AC voltage from overhead power lines. And so where a pipeline runs in a common corridor with a power line, an induced voltage will appear on that pipe of various levels, and that voltage needs to be reduced for worker safety mainly and that can be done on a steady state basis. The challenge with voltage is that you could have either a touch voltage or a step voltage that appears. A touch voltage is the voltage difference between the contact point for a person and the ground that they're standing on. So you could have a touch voltage between the hands and feet you could have a touch voltage between your hands if one was touching one structure, the other hand a different structure. All of those would constitute a touch voltage. A step voltage is where there's a voltage gradient in the earth. There's a voltage difference from point A to point B across the surface of the earth because of some other electrical phenomena that took place. It could be an AC fault or a lightning strike. It wouldn't be a steady state induced AC voltage. That wouldn't be high enough to be a level of concern for step voltage, only for touch voltage. In the way that you see this being addressed in this diagram is that it's very common to use a safety grounding mat to make the voltage uniform across the surface of the soil in the vicinity of that pipe. Let's talk about lightning. It has very particular characteristics that are shown here on this graph where it has a very fast rate of rise of current. And so the slope of that graph, the slope of that rising line, is extremely fast. So we call that a DIDT or rate of change of current. It goes up to some peak value, uh, which could be uh, various levels from thousands of amps to even up to a couple hundred thousand amps under worse conditions. And it rises in a certain rise time, say eight microseconds, and then it will decay back down to half of that peak value in 20 microseconds. And if that example waveform was used, we call that an eight by 20 microsecond waveform. So this is an event that happens very quickly. We measured in millionths of a second it has very high rate of rise of current, and that becomes an important factor in some of our calculations later. We don't want lightning to be confused with AC fault current. An AC waveform is an alternating signal. It has a cyclical or periodic basis to it, and one cycle takes about 17 milliseconds. There's 60 cycles per second, in North American power systems, or 50 hertz in other countries. And that time base for that kind of a signal, in order for it to be graphed, is on the order of milliseconds. 
if we were to compare that to lightning, lightning has to be graphed on a time scale of microseconds in order for it to be seen. The event is over so quickly otherwise. And so we have graphed AC current on the left and lightning on the right, but again, there's a time-based difference of 1,000 between those two in order to graph them. So different waveforms are going to produce very different effects in conductors and in systems and on pipelines. There are typical waveforms that are used for testing products that are used to protect against lightning. The 8 by 20 microsecond waveform or 4 by 10 microsecond, that's just a measure of the wave shape and how fast the rise time is of that waveform. And the current levels that these waveforms get up to, that peak value, is typically between 50 and 100 Ka as a peak value. In the real world, the values could be very widely varying uh, from perhaps thousands of amps to, 100, to th hundreds of thousands of amps. An AC fault is something that will typically last several cycles. Uh, the level that it reaches could be hundreds or thousands of amps, could be ten thousands of amps for a, an AC fault. What actually the pipeline sees is generally less than that number, unless there was some reason that there was a direct bond between a transmission line grounding system and a pipeline, uh, the values ought to be much less than that. A direct bond would represent the worst case con condition. And so an electrical fault occurs when there's some kind of insulation breakdown and an arc occurs, and for the time duration until that breaker clears the fault, that current will flow. Usually, again, that's several cycles of a 60 hertz waveform or several cycles of a 50 hertz waveform. So it's a relatively fast event, uh, but still much longer than a lightning event. So here you see in this graph the periodic basis of this AC waveform where one cycle is a complete positive and negative half cycle constituting that waveform, and the duration of a fault occurs uh, or is defined as the length of that event, either in milliseconds or in cycles. A faults result in a heavy current flow, and so all of the current conduction path has to be able to withstand that AC fault current, and that would certainly include conductors and connectors on those conductors, bonds to pipelines, it includes products that are used for protection. Those have to have ratings that exceed the available fault current in order for them to not fail under those conditions. And so product ratings can be determined from manufacturer data. Conductor ratings can be determined from ampacity charts. Here's an example of a conductor fault current withstand rating. You see current graphed on the vertical axis against time on the horizontal axis, and there's different conductors shown for the descending sloped lines. So you can see for different current time combinations whether a, a particular conductor would be suitable for that task. And obviously the larger conductors can handle higher fault currents, and so one merely sizes to coordinate that this is an example of manufacturer fault data where you see current ratings and time durations for different products. If we look, for example, at the 3.7 Ka column that represents one model of a particular product on the 60 Hertz table, you will see that the product is rated for 3700 amps for 30 cycles or 4,200 amps for 10 cycles, or 5,000 amps at three cycles, or 6,500 amps at one cycle. This is all the same product, just different current time combinations. So it's rated for high current for short time, down through lower currents for longer times. There also is valuable data available 
that relates to how an AC fault might affect a pipeline. And that is specifically the arc distance that can be established during a fault between a tower footing and a pipeline. And this graph is an example of distance being compared to soil resistivity for different voltage class systems, power line systems. So distance on the vertical axis compared to soil resistivity on the horizontal shows that for increasing soil resistivity, a pipeline could be closer to the towers without as much risk. As the soil resistivity lessens, a pipeline must be further away for a given voltage class. Another way to look at this graph is to say that as the voltage class of the transmission line goes up, the pipeline must be located further away, all things equal, in order to prevent an arc. What the arc distance graph tells you is that distance is extremely helpful. You would want to locate your pipeline, if you have the choice, further away from a transmission tower to reduce any possibility of arcing. Also, lower voltage systems, such as distribution power lines, have a lower risk associated with them. But also, don't be fooled, the, as we'll study, AC mitigation or AC induction relates to current flow. And so there can still be significant induction on a pipe, even from a distribution system. But just considering the arc distance problem, lower voltage class systems have lower risk. And also, increased soil resistivity reduces that fault exposure. It's not as conductive. For dealing with lightning and overvoltage, there are protective products, and those products have a voltage drop that will be developed across them as they do their work. That's a total voltage that will exist between the two points that are connected between. But there's another factor as well that produces a voltage during a lightning event, and that is that the conductors themselves, as they have lightning current flowing in them, have a significant voltage drop from point A to point B in the conductor. In fact, this factor is generally much larger than any threshold voltage of a protective product. The only thing that one can do to really combat that is to have a protective product with a low voltage drop to go into conduction, but mainly to have very short conductors or ideally to use bus bars to connect a product up to the structure. The overvoltage condition due to lightning, which relates again to conduction path, is really going to relate to inductance. Longer conductors have higher inductance. And we're going to look at this equation where the voltage that's developed will relate to the inductance L times the rate of rise of current. We had previously talked about the rate of rise of current for lightning being extremely high. The rate of rise of current for an AC fault is relatively quite low. So this really shows that lightning is the predominant problem here, not AC faults, when it comes to this inductance effect. The inductance L really relates to the conductor length, or the path length that the whole conduction must flow through. This is the one part that you're actually in control of to some degree, is the conductor length.